All righty. Well, let's get started this morning. Uh, welcome again, Bethany Air Peas. We come together for Sabbath school today. Our lesson today is going to come from the 18th and 19th chapter of the book of 2 Kings. And, you know, one of the things about the ARP quarterly is that, you know, it, it doesn't strictly follow uh, the quarter uh, as uh, the government would have that laid out. So we will be done with 2 Kings at the end of this month, and then we will pick up uh, beginning then uh, the 1st of December a new quarterly lesson, which will come to us from Galatians and Ephesians. So that will be the, the, the content of our next quarter. But uh, before we get to Paul's letters, we're going to close out our time here in 2 Kings. And today we're going to begin looking at the reign of Hezekiah, uh, one of the good kings of Israel, or of Judah. And so let's go ahead and begin our time together in prayer. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks again for this day and this time. We especially give thanks uh, for the encouragement that your word provides even in a dark day. And so to God we pray uh, for the work of the Holy Spirit uh, that you would open our hearts and our minds and receive your truth, that you would help us to understand not only uh, the nature of your work, but to God that we might see how that work uh, applies to us even today. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So again, uh, we find ourselves here in the midst of the life of the people of, of uh, Judah. Uh, obviously things are going on in Israel at the same time and the leaders of Judah are often tasked uh, with having to deal uh, with the wicked rulers of the north. And so much of what we hear of the reign of Hezekiah has as much to do with his difficulties with his northern neighbors as it does with the pagan or Canaanite uh, and Assyrian and Babylonian and all the other people out in the rest of the world. And one of the things obviously we learn from that is oftentimes the difficulties we face in the Christian life are not always from outside the house. You know, sometimes uh, they come from those who are supposed to be our, our blood brothers and sisters. And so a lot of what happened in Hezekiah's reign can help us understand how to deal with that as much as the other. So let's go ahead and begin this morning uh, looking at the first eight verses here of the 18th chapter of the book of 2 Kings. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hoshea, the son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abby, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father David had done. He removed the high places and broke the sacred pillars, cut down the wooden images, and broke in pieces the bronze serpent, serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the children of Israel burned incense to it and called it Neshestan. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor who were before him. For he held fast the Lord. He did not depart from following him but kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. The Lord was with him, he prospered wherever he went, and he rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. He subdued uh, the Philistines as far as Gaza and its territory from watchtower to fortified city. Amen. So, here we have the story of the early life, and really the whole life, of Hezekiah summarized for us in these opening eight verses. Now, there are a couple details here worth noting at the very beginning. Uh, the first thing that we see that's, that's worth paying attention to in verse 2 is that he's 25 years old when he begins to run. All right. Now, according to our system of government in the United States, how old do you have to be before you can run for president? 35, right? What office, or federal office, uh, requires the age of 25 before you can uh, become a member of it? That's right, the House of Representatives, right? You have to be 25 years old before you can run for the House of Representatives. Now, why do we put age barriers on elected office uh, in the United States? Right? You know, you know the brain's not fully developed <laughs> you know, at, at certain points, right? Um, experience, you know, understanding that a 35-year-old has a little bit more world experience than a 25-year-old. And one of the things, of course, that we can think of in that is you go back to the very founding of our Constitution, 
And you think about a lot of the men who wrote the Constitution. Yeah, every time, a lot of times you'll see this in meme form or some other, is how old you know, James Madison was when he wrote the Constitution, or how old Thomas Jefferson was when he wrote the Declaration of Independence. And, and one of the things that reminds us is that while, generally speaking, uh, youth is to be treated as youth, that's not always the case. You know, one of the things that we think about here with Hezekiah is that he becomes king at 25. Does it seem like Hezekiah needs any more, you know, maturation before he does the right thing? No. You know, he does the right thing right off the bat. Right. 25 years old, becomes king of a nation, and immediately does what the Lord requires of him. And one of the things, of course, we can learn from this is that, uh, you know, just as the proverb says, we are not to uh, you know, you know, uh, disabuse or uh, ignore the counsel of the, uh, of the elderly, right? Those with gray head, what are we supposed to do? But to rise up when they enter, right? And show respect. The Apostle Paul tells, tells Timothy what? Don't let people look down on you because of your young age. One of the things that we can learn from Hezekiah is that you know, we can make just as much a mistake as um, you, um, Rehoboam made by not listening to the counsel of his elders as we can if we look at somebody who's of a certain age and say, well, they can't do this because they're 25 or they're 21 or whatever. Right? What should be the standard by which we you know, you give somebody authority? The fruit that they possess, right? You know, there are young men who, who, who would make great elders or great deacons or even great ministers who, you know, might be 25 or 30 years old, right? We, don't, we shouldn't put artificial categories on office in the church. Now, there might be philosophical reasons why you want to do that in the state, but you know, in the church, again, we have to gauge everything by what fruit is being produced by the heart and the soul of the individual, right? And so Hezekiah here, now he becomes king at 25. We hear also that he is the son of Elak, uh, son of Ahaz, king of Judah. And we know something, of course, about his dad because, of course, we are told everything about the kings who, uh, you know, reigned in the days of, of Judah. Now, you know, if you want to, go ahead and, and go to uh, verse um, uh, 1 of chapter 16, because again, it's important always to get a little context. That's the only issue with bouncing around here a little bit in the quarterly. Now, at the beginning of chapter 16 of 2 Kings, we hear uh, in the 17th year of Pekah, the son of Ramalia, Ahaz, the son of Jotham, king of Judah, began to reign. Ahaz was 20 years old, became king, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem, and he did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord his God, as his father David had done, but he walked in the way of the kings of Israel. Indeed, he made his son pass through the fire, according to the abominations of the nations, whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. And he, bur and he sacrificed and burned incense in the high places, on the hills, and under every green tree. Now, this tells us something about the upbringing of uh, Hezekiah. You know, normally, who became king in, in when, a, when a king died or was removed from office? The oldest son, right? What are we told here, uh, implicitly, happened to the oldest son of Ahaz? He was sacrificed to the false gods of Canaan. Hezekiah wasn't supposed to be king. His older brother was. But his older brother was passed through the fire of Baal and killed because his dad was a reprobate and a wicked man. Now, you know, ordinarily in the scriptures, right, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Usually the dad and the son are pretty united with each other. But immediately, what do we know is the difference between Ahaz, the dad, and Hezekiah, the son? Evidently, Hezekiah fell off the tree and rolled down the hill. Right? He, he is nowhere near his dad. 
And we're told in chapter 18 that the reason why he is nothing like his dad is because, uh, not so much in verse 3, but in verse 5, what does it tell us of Hezekiah? He trusted in the Lord God of Israel. That's fundamentally the difference between his dad and him. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel. Now, again, when the writer of 2 Kings says this, right, he's saying a lot more than just that he was a godly fellow. There, there is a way that the writer of 2 Kings here is, is kind of highlighting for us that while the northern kingdom of Israel is apostate, God still understands that his people are one, right? Israel is the nation. Just because they're divided into two tribes in the south and ten tribes in the north doesn't mean that God still desires that those tribes would be together. Right? There's a, a sense of, of what we hear Jesus Christ say in John 17. Right? You know, what, what is John 17? It's the high priestly prayer, right? It's the prayer that Jesus offers in Gethsemane. And one of the things that Jesus prays for in John 17 is that we would not be separate from one another, but that we would be united together in Jesus Christ, right? Separation is always a bad thing in the eyes of the Lord. And so Jesus is always calling his people to come together as one in Christ. And so this same message is being proclaimed to us by the writer of 2 Kings about Hezekiah. Is that you know, Hezekiah is the true heir to the promises made to Abraham, the promises made to Moses, and the promises made to David. And that's one of the reasons why in this opening section we get a reference not just to David, which of course if he's a godly king, who's he going to act like? Well, David. Uh, the man who, uh, after God, or God's own heart. But we also get reference here to Moses. And we get two separate references to Moses. The first reference to Moses in verse 4 is it tells us that Hezekiah, as soon as he became king, removed the high places, broke the sacred pillars, cut down the wooden image, and then he does something which seems almost sacrilegious. Right. Yeah, we can understand the first part. And of course, the irony here is, is who had set up all of those images and all of these false idols? His dad Ahaz, right? You know, you know sometimes that comes to pass in, in, in real life, in history, right? The son has to clean up the mess of the father. Well, here we see him do that, right? He doesn't have any fear of doing that, right? He doesn't, he does, he's not afraid of his dad, right? He's afraid of the Lord, so he does what the Lord calls him to do. So he cleans up all this stuff, and then he breaks in pieces the broad servant that Moses had made. Now again, this, you know, just reading this from first glance, right, this seems, again, like I said, sacrilegious, right? Because who told Moses to make that broad servant? The Lord did, right? And you remember, the Lord had the people make that because they had been bitten by serpents, and they were wanting to be healed, so he told them to look up to the bronze serpent. Now, you know, fast forward, you know, 600 some odd years, and Jesus talks about the bronze serpent, right? And how does Jesus talk about the bronze serpent? Right, he's being lifted up just like the bronze serpent, and if we desire to be saved, what are we supposed to do? Look unto him, right? Look unto him at the cross at Calvary where our sins are forgiven by the shed blood of the Lamb, right? And here's Hezekiah breaking it, right? Again, it seems kind of, kind of off, off kilter there. But the reason given to us, why does Hezekiah break this bronze serpent? They were worshiping the bronze serpent, right? This is the exact same thing that Jesus is worried about in the Gospels. You know, people coming to him for what reason? To be healed, right? To, to have their bellies filled in John 6. The woman at the well thinks Jesus means she doesn't have to come to the well anymore, right? The, the, the idea that the outward symbols are the things that save, the outward symbols are the things that provide what we need, right? And of course we see this today, you know, all the time, 
right? You know, it, you know, in a more literal sense, right, we see this in the Roman Catholic Church, right? Because, you know, if you want to be helped, right, what's one of the things that you need to do if you're Roman Catholic? You need to go visit the shrines, right? You need to go to the grotto. Um, you know, one of the stranger things I've seen in my life is uh, when you used to drive back and forth uh, from Mississippi, West Virginia, on I-20 in Alabama, there is a, a, a road sign that tells you about this giant grotto that's outside Birmingham, Alabama. Now, would you identify Roman Catholic, uh, <laughs> Roman Catholic uh, signs with some place outside of Birmingham? No, but there's a giant grotto there, and if you go to that grotto, you can go, y'all know what a, a grotto is? A grotto is basically a cave that's been cut out of the rock where they have an altar set up. And you go there, you light candles, you offer prayers. And the idea is, is that the grotto is kind of like a wireless output, right? You know, that's where you go to be in the presence of God and your prayers go up from the grotto unto heaven, right? Now, yeah, but you also, of course, have, you know, in every Roman Catholic church, you have some kind of, of, um, of uh, uh, you know, I call them idols, but... You know, you have some kind of holy thing, a relic, uh, that sanctifies that sanctuary. Right? It'll be like a piece of the cross, or it'll be like the bone of a saint, or something of that nature, right? And so, if you desire, again, to receive help from the Lord, well, what do you need to do? You need to go up to that relic, right, and ask the Lord's help through the power of that saint. Now, again, that sounds strange to us, and it should sound strange to us. You know, one of the things I, when I was in Mexico back in February, we walked into the Roman Catholic Church in there in Baez, and they have a nun who is a holy, uh, you know, saint uh, in the back of the church, that her body is in a glass case in the back of the sanctuary. And when we walked in there, just to look around, being, you know, probably ignorant tourists, uh, walk in there, there were several ladies with veils on around this glass uh, sarcophagus, you know, doing their rosary and praying, uh, you know, to this lady to help with various things going on in their life. Now, again, that sounds strange to us, but, you know, Protestants aren't any better than Roman Catholics on one hand to that. You know, Protestants, they don't pray to dead people, but they often put their faith in living people. You know, Protestants have a real problem with building up men as the conduit to the Lord, right? You know, that, that's kind of where our idolatry takes its form, right? And what's one of the problems with putting your faith in men? Men are sinners, right? And so what happens when a man falls? There goes your faith with it, right? And I'm sure you can probably name situations in people you know's lives, well, that's happened. And again, I'm not just talking about famous people, right? You know, again, the, the danger of the human heart is always idolatry, right? It's always putting our faith and trust in those things which are not of the Lord, right? Into physical things instead of spiritual things. And so that's one of the reasons, again, why Hezekiah here has this idol destroyed, because it has become an idol, right? The, the bronze serpent is destroyed uh, because, again, he takes seriously what we read there in verse 6, the other mention of Moses. For he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded to Moses. Right? Yeah. In fact, if you go back and you read the story of the bronze serpent, Moses is very clear to Israel that the bronze serpent ain't doing nothing for them. Right? It is a physical manifestation of of the reality of what God has done in his son, Jesus Christ. So, again, and then in verse 7, we hear uh, that the Lord was with him. He prospered wherever he went, and he rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him, right? You know, again, the, the nature of his faith in the risen Christ, it, in the Lord our God, included that he was not going to serve Assyria. And why should Hezekiah not be afraid of Assyria? Because he serves the Lord God, right? He serves the one true and living God, so there's no reason to fear this 
human king who's not supposed to be ruling over the people. And that's kind of where we come next. In verse 9 it says, Now it came to pass in the fourth year of King Hezekiah, which was the seventh year of Hosea, the son of Elah, king of Israel, that Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up against Samaria and besieged it. At the end of three years they took it, in the sixth year of Hezekiah, that is the ninth year of Hosea, king of Israel, Samaria was taken. Then the king of Assyria carried Israel away captive to Syria and put them in Hala and by the Habor, the river of Gozan, and then the cities of the Medes, because they did not obey the voice of the Lord, their God, but transgressed his covenant and all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded, and they would neither hear nor do them. So again, here in the fourth year of Hezekiah, we get, again, a physical testimony of the consequences of disobeying the Lord of God. The Lord God, right? What happens if you disobey the Lord God and follow after the idols and transgress his covenant? You pay for it, right? Now, the, the New Testament teaches the same thing. We cannot believe that all, the outward sign of the covenant is going to keep us from going to hell. Right? The Jews put their faith in circumcision, and too many Christians put their faith in baptism. Now, that's not to downplay baptism or say that circumcision wasn't important. Right? It's a necessary and required act in the Christian faith. But, again, just because you walked an aisle, just because you had water put on you, does not mean you're going to heaven. What is the marker of assurance in the Christian life? The acceptance, the acceptance of Jesus Christ, right? The heart religion, right? The, the circumcision of the heart that is necessary. You see, a, uh, nor the Northern Kingdom thought that because they were circumcised, because they prayed to God, because they did outward things to the Lord, that they were going to be saved from the judgment that had fallen on the tribes in the land. You know, the Apostle Paul talks about this in the book of Hebrews in chapter 10 uh, when he talks about those who, 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 who trample upon the blood of Jesus Christ, right? Who, 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 who abandoned the covenant promise that Christ has made unto them. Now, in Hebrews, Paul is primarily talking about Jews. Right? Those who had, again, were fleshly sons of Abraham. But the same principle applies to Christians. Right? You, there are plenty of people who were good people, who did good things, who were outwardly you know, good people, who came to church every week, who were baptized, who ate the Lord's Supper, and who are now burning in hell. Now, why is that the case? Right, it was all on the outside, right? It's the it, it's the it's the whitewashed tomb problem that Jesus notes in Matthew twenty three, right? The the outside is clean and beautiful, and, but what what's inside of the whitewashed tomb? Dead man's bones, right? And so the one of the things that is hammered home, uh, almost to the point uh, of uh, you know overdoing it. Uh, not that I would ever say that, but right in Second Kings is that there's a very clear difference between somebody who outwardly follows Jesus and somebody who inwardly rests and trusts in him for salvation. Right? And that is seen again in the trust that we have in Jesus Christ. Right? One of the things that the Western Confession of Faith is really you know, you know, you know, vitally marking out is that true faith is not just assent to the details of salvation, right? In other words, merely affirming that Jesus Christ died for your sins on the cross is not a saving work, right? There's a holy resting and trusting on the finished work of Christ as the means of our salvation, right? There is that assent and that trusting that is necessary. And again, we see this in Hezekiah because every time he is offered an opportunity to doubt the promises of God, what does he do? He affirms what God has said. That's why the writer of 2 Kings tells us once more that Hezekiah trusted in the Lord his God. Right? Probably the, the most pressing example of this in, in the Old Testament is Abraham offering up Isaac. You remember in that 
in that scene as Abraham's getting ready to offer up Isaac as they're going up the hill, right? What does Isaac say to his father? Where's the sacrifice? <laughs> Which would have been my, my question at the same time. What does Abraham say? The Lord will provide, right? Does Abraham know how the Lord's going to provide? But he knows the Lord's going to provide because he trusts in his God, right? Because God's made a promise to him that out of him is going to come many nations. He knows Isaac is the fulfillment of that promise. And he also knows that God gave him the sixth commandment, which is thou shalt not kill. And what would sacrificing Isaac be? It'd be murder, right? Because we're not supposed to kill people. So again, Abraham shows and witnesses that he did not just believe in God, he believed of God, right? That there is, again, this twofold testimony to it. And so Hezekiah again witnesses this because in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, in verse 13, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. Then Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria at Lachish, saying... Uh, I have done wrong. Turn away from me. Whatever you impose on me, I will pay. And the king of Assyria asked Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. So Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord and the treasure of the king's houses. And at that time, Hezekiah stripped the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord and from the pillars which Hezekiah, king of Judah, had overlaid and gave to the king of Assyria. Now, again, this sounds like Hezekiah is afraid. Because what is he doing? Giving all the gold away, right? But again, you know, one of the things that, that young men have to learn, and, and some of us had to learn this the hard way, is discretion sometimes is the better uh, you know, part of valor, right? Uh, one of the dangers young men fall into is that when their courage is questioned, uh, what do they feel like they need to do? They need to prove themselves, right? And again, does proving your courage you know, often end up with? No, right? Especially when you get popped in the face in the midst of it, right? So again, Hezekiah recognizes that is he or his kingdom ready to face the army of Sennacherib? No, right? So is he in sin for stripping the gold off the tent? No, right? Because again, one of the points that this guy's making here is does the gold in the temple mean anything? No, right? What, what matters in the temple? Spirit. Spirit of the Lord, right? The outward things are passing away as, uh, as the Bible tells us. And so again, Hezekiah testifies to the nation that he is willing to take the gold off the temple in order to save their backsides rather than fight a battle he can't win. And this is something that Josiah, another godly king, does not like. Right? Because remember, Josiah, how does Josiah get killed? In battle, right? And one of the reasons Josiah gets killed in battle is because he foolishly assumes that because the Lord's on his side, he can take out one of the largest armies ever assembled. Now, has God done that in the past? Yes, right? God has taken a small band and destroyed a large army, right? Does that mean God is going to do that every time? No, right? You know, and one of the mistakes Josiah makes is, is who does he not ask? Doesn't ask God, right? And so he receives the judgment for it. It's kind of the flip side of the problem after Jericho, right? Remember, they look at AI and they say, oh, AI is no big deal. We can take AI. Matter of fact, we're not even going to send our whole force over there. And of course, what happens? They get defeated, right? Again, the, the, one of the difficulties of Christian life is that, you know, who do we need to ask for wisdom every time we do something? The Lord, right? You know, we need to make sure that the Lord, you know, is on our side before we just run off and make assumptions about things. So again, what he does here, again, is prepare his people and make them ready so that they are ready when the day comes. Now, Sennacherib, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but Sennacherib, uh, and this is repeated in Isaiah 36, uh, the king of Assyria sends this letter to uh, the nation of Judah, boasting against the Lord, saying all these things are going to happen. And, you know, as we hear in, in the verse 
31 of chapter 18, uh, we are told, or, or he is told uh, by the prophet, do not listen to Hezekiah, or the prophet talking to Sennacherib says, do not listen to Hezekiah, for thus says the king of Assyria, make peace with me by a present and come out to me, and every one of you eat from his own vine and every one from his own fig tree, and every one of you drink the water of his own cistern until I come and take you away to a land like your own, a land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive groves and honey that you may live and not die, but do not listen to Hezekiah, lest he persuade you, saying, the Lord will deliver us. Has any of the gods of the nations at all delivered its land from the hand of the king of Assyria? You know, this is what we call famous last words, right? Because, you know, Sennacherib is comparing the gods of the nations versus the god of Israel. And what's the biggest difference between the gods of the nations and the gods of Israel? The god of Israel. <laughs> you know, the god of Israel exists. The rest of them don't. So, of course, the other nations weren't able to withstand the Sennacherib. Again, this is... Uh, the proverb come to life, pride goeth before the fall. See, Hezekiah is trying to tell, it, tell Judah, be patient, wait for the deliverance of the Lord. And of course, what does everybody in, it, in Judah want to do? Well, they want to get at it, right? But Hezekiah is telling them, wait, the Lord will come in his deliverance. And again, go to the New Testament. What, what, what is Judas' biggest problem? O ye of little faith, right? He is anxious and he doesn't understand what Jesus is there to do, right? And again, this testimony is true even of, even of the most, you know, mature believers, right? What's, what's one of the hardest things that we have to learn in the Christian life? Patience, right? The promise is that the Lord will provide deliverance. And again, the hardest thing for us to understand is that in whose timing will that deliverance come? In the Lord's time, right? And what are we supposed to do while we wait for the Lord's deliverance? Pray and trust, right? And so when the word of the Lord comes from the prophet Isaiah, and I'm going to skip there to verse 21 in 2 Kings 19, when the word of the Lord comes concerning Sennacherib, we hear the prophet Isaiah say, that Then Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Because you have prayed to me against Sennacherib, king of Assyria, I have heard. And this is the word which the Lord has spoken concerning me. The virgin, the daughter of Zion, has despised you, laughed, laughed you to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem has shaken her head behind your back, whom you have reproached and blasphemed, against whom you have raised your voice and lifted up your eyes on high against the Holy One of Israel. By your messengers you have reproached the Lord and said, By the multitude of my chariots, I have come up to the height of the mountains, the limits of Lebanon. I will cut down its tall cedars and its choice cypress trees. I will enter the extremity of its borders to its fruitful forest. I have dug and drunk strange water, and with the soles of my feet I have dried up all the brooks of defense. Did you not hear long ago how I made it from ancient times that I formed it? Now I have brought it to pass that you should be for crushing fortified cities into heaps of ruin. Therefore their inhabitants had little power. They dismayed and confounded. They were of the grass uh, of the field and the green herb as the grass on the housetops and grain blinded before it's grown. But I know your dwelling place. You're going out and you're coming in and your rage against me because your rage against me and your tumult have come up to my ears. Therefore I'll put my hook in your nose and my bridle on your lips and I will turn you back by the way which you came. All right. Now, them are some... Them some words, right? Think about the last verses there that we read, right? What is the Lord going to do to Sennacherib? He's going to put the hook in what? In your nose, my bridle on your lips, and I will turn you back. Now, what, what does that sound like? I promise, yes, right? Um, you know, and, and you think about the, the image there again. You know, what's, what's, what's he hooking to in the nose? You know, what, what did we used to do to bulls? Well, I guess they still do it, but... And you put that ring in the nose, right? Tie her up to him, leave him around, right? That's exactly what's being imaged here. Right, and the, part of it is, too, I mean, it was pretty common in pagan cultures back in those days to do what uh, to your nose? Put a, put a hook, put a ring in it, right? 
Well, again, the image here is, is that God's going to put his hook in there and he's going to take you back where you came from. And not only is he going to do that, but he's going to put a bridle in your lips. So what are you not going to be able to do while you're on your way back? Run your mouth. Right. You, you know, again, there is, a, there's always this kind of play on words in Isaiah. You know, Jesus, right? He is, he goes dumb as a sheep to the slaughter, right? You know, and that's a, a beautiful passage of the willingness of Jesus Christ to lay down His life for our sins. However, how is Sennacherib going to experience the walk to judgment, right? As a condemned man on the way to the gallows, right? There's a huge difference between those two things. So we hear this promise, right? And so in verse 35, we get to hear how it comes to pass. And it came to pass on a certain night that the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And when people arose early in the morning, there were corpses all dead. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went away, returned home, remained at Nineveh. And it came to pass as he was worshiping the temple of Nishrach his god and his sons Adramelech and Sherezer struck him down with a sword, and they escaped in the land of Ararat. Then Irshadon, his son, reigned in his place. So, whenever we hear the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, who are we meant to think of? Jesus. Because who is the angel of the Lord? Jesus, right? Now, in, in, in Revelation 19, we see the angel of the Lord, Jesus Christ, do the same to all the nations of the earth which have belied themselves with Antichrist. Right, who have made league with Satan. Right, what did Jesus do to them on the day of judgment in Revelation 19? It's the exact same thing. Right? He destroys them and sends them to the lake of fire. Right? And so the promise we see in 2 Kings 19 is, you know, again, there's many things to take from this, but to kind of close out on this, right? the reminder here is, is that if you are on the Lord's team, as it were, what are you going to see? You're going to see the victory, right? Are you going to see the victory in your lifetime? Maybe not. But what is the assurance you have as you see the nations performing wickedness? Right. The judgment will come to all those who do not bow the knee to Jesus Christ. Right. That's what Psalm 2 says, right? You know, if you don't bow the knee to Jesus Christ, what's he going to do with his rod of iron? He's going to smash you in the mouth, right? And so Sennacherib is kind of a, a, a picture here for all the leaders of the nations to be humbled and to be reminded that God alone is the Lord of heaven and earth. And we'll close on that. But any questions or comments about 2 Kings 18 and 19? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks again for the time you give to us and, and especially the way uh, that uh, we can learn so much from Hezekiah and especially from the wickedness of Sennacherib. God, it's a keen reminder to us that uh, not only must we rest in you, but we are called to trust in you, to be at peace in the love of your son Jesus Christ who has uh, borne the judgment due uh, unto us for sin. He, he has walked that path uh, that we would not have to. And he has been raised from the dead that we might not only receive the forgiveness of sins, but the righteousness uh, of his life. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>